Hey up and welcome to the Strategy Sessions. My name is Andy Jarvis. I am your host for today and the Strategy Director at Eximo Marketing. Thank you for listening. Today is quite an exciting time for me. This is episode 50, right? Five zero of the Strategy Sessions. It started as a, a bedroom lockdown project where I thought, you know what, I'm going to interview some marketing people because I've got loads of time on my hands and what else are you going to do, right? Because the world needs another man in his 40s producing a podcast. But here we are, um, what, three years later coming up and 50 episodes in. Thank you for being along uh, this amazing journey with me. The first episode was Jen Hoffman. Jen is a friend of mine who'd moved from uh, the search industry into being CMO of a startup and... I loved that episode. It had a real energy to it, a real uh, fire from Jen, which was fantastic. Um, please, if, you, if you've never listened to the very first episode, go back and have a listen and see how much the show's developed and adopted and adapted and, and changed over time. There's uh, a little bit less about the show in many ways. It, there was top tips from somebody else. There was an extra guest. There was me doing rants about stuff. It's much more streamlined, much slicker, much quicker to put together, if I'm honest, because... I'm not only allowed out of the house for an hour a day now, I've actually got proper work to do and clients to go and see and stuff going on. Um, but we were every two weeks in the first year, pretty much for the whole year, just bump, 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 punching them out, uh, which is how we've got to 50. This is technically, if you've tuned in, season three, episode nine, I think. Um, but yeah, 50 overall. Uh, so please do, you know, dip into some in the back catalogue uh, and have a listen. I think what's important at this stage, at Christmas, I talked about like the most popular episodes so far. And number of listeners is a fantastic metric for um, well, popularity, obviously, because that, that's what it is. But it's not necessarily a, um, a great measure of quality. It's often a measure of how famous the guest is or, or um, you know, what the guest has done previously, not necessarily the things they're going to say. No, they were all good things. Mark Ritson, April Dunford, uh, Ash McDonald, you know, telling great stories and, and with lots of great information, Adrian Wells. Dan Rebel, people like that. So, you know, these people are saying great things and, and are receiving a lot of listens and streams and downloads and things like that. But not every episode gets that, but that's sometimes because the guest isn't as famous, but there's some really great people saying some really great things over the, over the time. I make notes in every episode. I learn so much and I take things forward and I use it in um, in my own work with clients. I use it in presentations. I use it in workshops. Um, so please do dive back in, have a listen to some old episodes. To that end, we're actually going to, I've pulled in some regular listeners on the podcast, people who I know tune in a lot, and ask them to pick out kind of a one lesson they've taken from the show. We're going to put that together, hopefully for the next episode, for episode 51, and we're going to review the 50 episodes, not all of them one by one, that'd be really, really boring. But just a handful of people picking up a couple of lessons that they've picked up from the podcast, and we're going to get on and we're going to talk about it, and hopefully that might trigger you to go back and listen to another episode. It might give you uh, some ideas to take into your own work. Who knows? Um, but it seems like a nice idea to kind of pause at 50 and go, let's just look how far we've come. Celebrate your wins, right? You know, 50 episodes. I never thought I'd get it. I committed to do it for a year and here we are three years later and I love it. And I hope that comes across and I hope you love it too. Um, I don't think you can get to a point where you say, I hope you love the podcast without saying, make sure you've subscribed and smash that notification button or whatever it is that people say. But no, please do. If you like the, the podcast and enjoy it, share it with someone, send it to someone else who's in marketing, um, who's not in marketing, even just needs to know more about it. Um, share, spread the love, right? Subscribe, tell people about it. If you don't like it, if you want something improving, tell me, right? I can change things. I love getting feedback. Um. I got some feedback the other day from someone who is a listener, regular listener now, who I met at a conference a few years ago. And it was an episode I actually thought was a bit flat. I was a bit flat in the episode. And when I listened back to that one, I was a little bit disappointed with how it uh, it all came together. Um, so when somebody got in touch unprompted and said, love the podcast and um, love this episode particularly, there was so much learning in it. You realize, you go, ah, okay. Yeah, people get stuff out of this. And that's what, that's what I look, I do it for me, right? I do it because it keeps me going. It keeps me learning and keeps me talking to people, which I really, really enjoy. But the fact that people who are listening get stuff out of the episodes as well, that's what I enjoy too. So on with episode 50, because we can't review 50 episodes without having 50 episodes to review, right? So let's start with episode 50 and a special treat for you. 
not a marketer today. Uh, it's Karina Dawley. Karina's an economist, not a marketer. Why is there an economist on the show? Well, unless you've been living under a rock for a year or two, you'll have seen inflation rates going through the roof. You'll have seen the cost of living crisis, your fuel costs going up. Uh, this isn't just a UK problem. This is a, a, a worldwide problem, really. I have a cousin in America and um, uh, where fuel's priced in gallons and dollars. So trying to do the conversions from gallons to liters as we sell it over here in the UK, and then the conversion from dollars to sterling. It took me forever. But I finally worked it out, and I sent him a, a comparison cost of the price of what we pay here in the UK, and his eyes nearly fell out of his head. He was like, how does anybody afford to drive when you, when you pay that much for gas? I'm like, yeah, and it's just gone through the roof as well. So you'll have noticed all these things happening. Now, marketing doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? We live in a world where people need money in their pocket to buy the things that we're selling. And if we're, if no one has any money, no one's buying it. doesn't matter how great or terrible you are. So we need to talk about the fact that there's a recession coming in the UK, that forecasted growth by the IMF is now negative. So, and with the only developed economy, uh, developed, I hate that phrase, but with the only economy the IMF was talking about in this study, that's forecast to contract in 2023. I wonder why that is. You think of all those European economies that stayed in the European Union and managed not to contract, but the one that left is contracting. No, I, I, I wonder what the correlation might possibly be between those two things. But we talk about that. So I thought, look, let's get an economist on the show. Let's unpack what things like recession actually mean, what the issues are, what the problems are, um, what the opportunities are. Because a recession doesn't mean the end of everything. It just means the economy is shrinking a little bit in this particular recession. So there are opportunities. There are green shoots. There are things you can focus on. So strap up, buckle up. Get yourself a pen, a notebook, have a listen to Karina, and we're going to talk about the economy. So my guest today on the Strategy Sessions is Karina Dawley. Karina, welcome to the Strategy Sessions. Thank you very much, Andy. Now, you are um, a first on the Strategy Sessions. So it's episode 50, and you're the very first person who does your job to be on the show. Uh, so do you want to explain to everyone else what your job is? Uh, because it's not necessarily a marketing job. No, I should be really upfront from the beginning. I'm an economist, so <laughs> I'm the good kind. Um, so I studied economics at Trinity College Dublin, at Cambridge, at University College, College Dublin, and then spent a lot of time on the continent in Luxembourg and uh, Germany, and um, basically doing research on poverty, inequality, and how the tax benefit system contributes to both of these things, and also how it affects work incentives. So what makes people want to work and what keeps them at home? Well, uh, listen, I love how you just um, casually mentioned probably the best university in Ireland, the university in England, which is tied for the reputation with the reputation of the best university in England. I just kind of glossed over them as if they were just shops that you nipped into at the weekend. But we'll probably come back to talking about education and, and, and things at the end. What I wanted to get into is to talk about your experience. And if you're listening to this and thinking marketing podcast, why have we got an economist on? I mean, well, as a marketer, you've probably been aware that the cost of living crisis might be affecting your sales at the minute. You might uh, have noticed that people are struggling for money because their energy bills have gone up. Marketing doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? People's lives don't exist in a vacuum. All these other macroeconomic things that are going on have an impact on people's lives. And most marketers I've spoken to, and when I say most, I'm including myself in that, haven't got a clue what it means, what some of these terms mean. I had a really interesting conversation with someone about inflation the other week who thought that because inflation was falling, that meant prices were going to fall. And I'm like, no, that's deflation, not what you're talking about. So I thought, do you know what? What we need is someone who can explain all these things, tell us what they mean, and dive into what the problems are and how we can fix them. So nothing major to do in the next hour. No, no, no. We'll sit through that. Easy, dead easy, dead easy. So let's tell, first of all, let's talk about what is causing this cost of living crisis. I hate the phrase cost of living crisis, but what's driving it? Because it's it's a unique set of, situa set of circumstances, isn't it? That's causing prices to rise everywhere. That's right. It's really a combination of factors. So, you know, I'm sure your listeners will be familiar with each of these in isolation, but together they're all driving the huge surge in prices we've seen over the last number of years. So the first factor is the pandemic. The pandemic affected the demand for goods and services, but in particular, consumption shifted away from services. So people couldn't go to restaurants or go for their facial or use those services that they used to use because they were all closed down. So they shifted their consumption to goods, to things that are manufactured, and that led to a rise in demand for 
raw materials and intermediary parts at a time when logistics were under severe pressure. So things weren't moving about as easily. So when you have you know, high demand for something that's not easily available, that leads to inflation, that pushes the price up. And that actually still remains somewhat of an issue. I mean, until very recently, there were still um, serious lockdowns in China. So it, you know, the supply chains aren't moving as easily as they used to anymore, although it has improved drastically since 2020. So the pandemic's the first thing. The second thing is the war in Ukraine. So um, that has led to shocks in the energy and food market because Russia and Ukraine provide large amounts of grain in the global market. Um, and there are also energy embargoes on Russia. So both of those things are driving up the cost of two key um, sort of uh, products that people use every day, households use food and fuel. And since the main drivers of inflation now are food and fuel. That's really affecting low income households more than it is high income households because most of their money goes on food and fuel, whereas high income households might spend a larger proportion on luxuries or services and so on. Mm -hmm. So it, this is a global problem, really, isn't it? That has, you've mentioned China because a lot of, of the things we buy off the shelves are made in China, uh, Russia because energy comes from Russia in terms of oil and gas. Um, Ukraine, because some raw materials for uh, you know lots of products and cookery and things like that come from there. And there's been other things as well, I think, with kind of rice harvests and potato crops and things failing in different parts of the world over the years. So all of this has kind of come together to, to drive prices up. So inflation, I see the BBC constantly, almost daily, trying to explain what inflation is to people. So give us a, a kind of a, a one, two sentence definition of what inflation is. And maybe as well, just for the person I was talking to the other week, and I won't mention the name, what's the difference between sort of inflation going up and coming down and deflation? So inflation means that prices are rising and prices are, are usually rising, right? So we're used to a certain level of inflation. Um, you know, the central bank might target a specific level that they want to keep inflation under, and that's fine. The inflation we're seeing at the moment is way beyond those targets. We're talking 10% year on year. That means that um, this year, a product will cost you 10% more than it did last year. Now, when we talk about inflation going down, and it is starting to go down, and the expectations are that it will sort of come under control later this year, that means that price rises are going prices are going to be rising less fast okay so that 10 percent increase that we've seen over the last year that's here to stay more or less right we'll see more increases over the next year and after that but um really what's what we're going to see is a permanently higher price level for most things. Now, the, the Office for Budget Responsibility in the UK is forecasting maybe there's going to be some deflation, you know, in 2024, 2025. There, there might be, but that's not going to undo all of the price increases that we've seen to date. Yeah. And uh, so the, the risk with inflation then is as prices get go up, up and up, everyone has to put the prices up. Wage demands get higher, price, so prices go up again, and you get caught in this cycle where, Prices just keep going up, up and up and get faster and faster and faster because everything's getting more expensive. I, I, it's kind of broadly, I think, the, the, the way it, it, the theory anyway. So to stop that, central banks deploy what to the layman sounds like a really cruel tactic to uh, it's like you skint because everything's gone up in price. So the central bank has a great idea. What what do central banks do to control inflation? So I think that this. I'm at the edge of my experience here as a microeconomist trying to con um, comment on central bank policy, but I'll give it a go. So at a very basic level, if you increase interest rates, this encourages people to save more and to borrow less. So this reduces the demand for goods and services. It makes people want to spend less money and puts downward pressure on prices. But the inflationary environment we're in at the moment is very particular. So it's quite unique, right? Most of the price experiences, uh, the price increases we're experiencing are out of our control, right? In the UK and Ireland or in the Eurozone, they're out of our control. They are to do with the remnants of the pandemic or the war in Ukraine. The other sort of unique factor here is that inflation is highest for what economists call necessary goods. So the goods we can't really shift our consumption away from. We need food and we need fuel. So it's not really clear that households can easily reduce their expenditure on these goods. On top of that, as you've mentioned, interest rates then are pushing up mortgage repayments and reducing the value of people's houses. And that further reduces their standard of living. So I suppose I don't have a clear answer on this, but I think if we do see inflation unwinding in the next year or two, we might see 
um, return to a lower long run interest rate. So some of the hikes are reversed. And, and going back to your work in your area of speciality as well, it feels like this hiking interest rates, even if it's not, if you're in a rental sector rather than a mortgage sector, it's often passed on to you as a renter anyway, because the, the mortgage has gone up for your landlord, therefore your, your prices go up anyway. It feels like the people who are going to get whacked most by rising interest rates are not the ones spending on luxuries anyway. It's the people at the very margins of uh, financial affordability and people who are living in or near fuel poverty anyway, isn't it? Are they not the ones who are going to be affected worse by central bank policy like this? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting uh, thought. So this is what we call the incidence of the tax, right? So you you can increase um, interest rates and have uh, mortgage holders pay a higher rate of interest on their borrowings. But if they are renting their home out to um, a private renter, and if the rental market is quite tight, let's say there isn't a lot of supply of rental properties, then that is going to get completely passed off on because they can, because the market will allow them to raise prices like that. So that is certainly the case in Ireland at the moment. There's very low supply of rental properties. So you would imagine that any increase in mortgage rates is just going to be passed right through to, to the renter. Yeah. And, and while these are all global problems, every um, you're based in, in Ireland and... Uh, a lot of the listeners are in the UK and the Eurozone as well. And and different countries within those jurisdictions are responding to this crisis in a different way, aren't they? So so not everybody is, um, to, to roll back a few months and to those heady months where it felt like a fever dream of um, how different prime ministers every week or different chancellors every week in the UK um, doing the best to crash the economy. But not everyone has responded to the crisis of raising prices in the same way. So how have Ireland handled it? Is anybody else in the Eurozone, Eurozone doing well or badly? And, and you know, if you can talk about the UK without laughing, please do. Uh, that would be interesting to know as a, as a contrast. Sorry, I've already not managed that. <laughs> um, so if you if you, we go back to last October, uh, September, October, there were massive differences in between the budget announced by the Irish government and the mini budget announced by the then chancellor. So the, the mini budget basically promised massive tax cuts without any sort of indication of how they might be funded. And that was disastrous. We all know what happened then. So the reversal of that mini budget and then the autumn statement were the policy changes in those were a bit more similar to the Irish budget. So it's the Irish policy response to the cost of living crisis. So both governments targeted a number of one off payments at low income households through the benefit system. So here is the, the, I suppose the thought experiment was this. They weren't sure how long inflation was going to stay high and. Um, they didn't want to permanently increase benefit levels in case it became unmanageable. So they give out one off payments to help people sort of weather the storm in a sort of a kicking the can down the road exercise, if you like. So we'll deal with this again this time next year. And um, the where they differed in their policy response was tax. So uh, Minister Donoghue in Ireland increased tax thresholds in Ireland to also help to compensate higher income households from inflation but tax thresholds have been frozen in the UK for the next number of years. And this uh, amounts to an effective tax increase, right? If you freeze the, the level at which you start to pay the higher rate of tax in an economy where wages are growing every year, which is the case in the UK, and um, that is going to put a higher tax burden on earners. So that is a, that is a tax hike. And the effect of that tax hike, the, the extent of it, will depend on what the level of inflation is. So there's been, um, I suppose the UK, you may say, and I think I, I'll say this, you know, the UK under Liz Truss's leadership effectively got it wrong. I think that the the way that the markets responded, the way that the public responded, and the fact that um, a lettuce in the Daily Star outlasted Liz Truss as Prime Minister shows that, generally speaking, people didn't buy into to the changes that she made. But but for the sake of, of, of the discussion, because it, it is an interesting point, one of the things that they wanted to do was cut corporation tax. So corporation tax is the, the tax businesses who pay on their profits. And they wanted to do that. The theory goes, you cut the tax, therefore you bring in more investment into the country, and that generates bigger uh, companies coming here, making more profits, which funds all the things you want to do. And that was lambasted generally around the world by, by uh, lots of people for, for this particular approach. However, one of the interesting things is Ireland has a much lower rate of corporation tax than the UK. It's 19%, I think, currently in the UK, rising to 26 shortly. 
and it's about 12% in Ireland. Is that right? You, you give us the right figures in a moment. So Ireland has got this much lower rate of corporation tax, which has helped to fund the things that it's got. Uh, it's, it's done over the last year or so, whereas the UK w- w- was kind of laughed at globally for trying to match that. What's the what's the kind of the the the, the bit that's missing around all of that was about why the UK's plan wasn't going to work and why people were like, no, you can't do that just yet. I mean, by itself, it's not technically a bad policy decision to cut corporation tax. If you believe that it's going to attract corporations to come and base themselves in the country and to trade and to sort of make up the shortfall by being profitable and paying tax at the lower rate. Um, potentially the fact that it was uh, announced with a whole range of labour tax cuts as well didn't help. But also, I mean, you kind of have to look at the markets at this point. The markets clearly, the markets being people, right, people who invest, didn't believe that this was going to work. Right. And, you know, when when a whole market believes that it's not going to work, then typically it will not work. It's self-fulfilling. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it, so in the end, it was the right decision to reverse that. Now, that doesn't mean that it would never be a good policy decision to cut corporation tax. So Ireland has had a very low rate of corporation tax for many years now. And it's been sort of a, a great success, I would say, for the country, although it doesn't come without its drawbacks. So. Our low corporation tax rate means that we attract lots of multinationals to base themselves in Ireland. Um, But the issue is that a lot of our corporation tax and a lot of our tax overall comes from a very small number of companies. So if something happens to one of those companies, they get a mad CEO or their sector isn't doing well or something like that, that can have not thinking of anyone in particular now. Would you like to name any names, Karina, <laughs> when you talk I'll... about mad CEOs? No, no, I'll pass no. on that one. Well, um... I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I mean, look, if, if hypothetically speaking, if we were to, let's come up with a name, maybe like Melon Usk or something like that for somebody, but we'll just hypothetically Excellent Melon. Excellent hypothetical name. Melon, Melon Usk, perhaps, or something. Yeah. So if Melon Usk tanks their company, then that would have a massive impact on um, the tax take in Ireland. So, it, you know, and it would, could significantly affect the ability of the government to fund activities. So the the um, the way the Irish government deals with that is that they use what they call excess corporation tax receipts, what they think could be sort of receipts of a volatile nature or, or might not be repeated. They put those aside typically or try to put them aside and not to use them for day-to-day spending like you're not going to use something like that to increase benefits or to cut taxes you might use it for a capital spending project a one-off thing okay so it has been really useful over the course of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis because there have been a need there has been a need for lots of one-off payments so corporation taxation has been very important there for the country and has, i suppose kept our economy very robust but it does come with the downsides as well if you haven't been to Dublin recently, uh, you need to go again, right? Because it's a phenomenal city where, uh, especially around the canal area and um, the financial services district, I forget what the proper name for it is, but you've got Google, uh, Facebook slash Meta, Twitter are there, HubSpot are there. Uh, basically, all the major US tech companies seem to have their, their uh, European headquarters based in Dublin. Although I suppose since we first started talking about doing this interview, Karina, the, the US tech companies have announced the about 50,000 job losses in the last two weeks, I think, um, you know, across the likes of Amazon, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and, and various other places. So it is, as you say, that there's no there's no perfect solution to this problem, is there? You know, every the corporation tax is great in one, but then it can quite, quite quickly turn, but, you know, turn sour, can't it? So, um, absolutely, absolutely. And while the, te- the tech companies did so well during the pandemic, um, it seems, well, it, se- it seems from observation that, um, maybe they overinvested and um, now they need to lay off some staff and maybe they're back to their kind of pre-pandemic steady state and hopefully that that will just sort of keep ticking over. Um, but it sort of remains to, miss, to be seen if there are any, any deeper trouble than that. Yeah. So across, we can see there's the start of what may be a recession in different places. So a recession, just to give us the economic version of what a recession is, because we, we hear the term recession is mentioned almost daily at the minute. Uh, what, what's the, the there is a particular definition of a recession? Do you want to uh, share that with us? So the 
an economy is technically in recession if it uh, records negative economic growth for so GDP growth for two successive quarters. So if you have six months where um, growth is negative, so the economy contracts, then you are in a recession. I always think that's a that's a really weird definition. I, I, <laughs> I, as not, I think only economists think everything should grow constantly. You know, it just feels like a normal. You know, you're up a little bit, you're down a little bit, but two so two quarters of negative economic growth is a recession. Um, that's right. Right. Okay. And, and so, I mean, the, sorry, the economy, the economy grows every year, and that's because um, we are more productive every year, right? Through innovation, R and D, and so on. So, you would expect the economy to be growing slowly every year, as you know, people get better at doing stuff, right? Yeah. Um, you know, firms and individuals are constantly innovating and building on what they already know. So, when when the economy grows, is improved access to goods and services, including healthcare, education, and that increases um quality of life and increases our lifespan as well Mm -hmm. and prices and wages tend to grow too although um at different rates right so prices don't always grow at the same rate as wages but when the economy doesn't grow so that's when we think this is this is problematic why is the economy not growing why are we not being more productive it's usually not because people aren't innovating it's there's something structural wrong in the economy right and so that's what we term a recession so we've got fewer goods and services produced or consumed and less money available for wage increases or to spend and i think that the lesson for for marketers in this though is that that while we talk about and we are talking about the economy as a whole even inflation as a whole is that actually when you drill down into the, the economy isn't just one thing is it there's so many moving parts to that so not every sector in the economy is if we are in a recession, which the Bank of England thinks we are, although we might not be until we get the results through. But assuming we are in a recession at the moment, that doesn't necessarily mean every section of the economy is shrinking, does it? It just means that maybe the bigger ones can be shrinking because it's an average figure. Absolutely. So, I mean, even during the, the pandemic, we saw that some sectors did very well and some sectors didn't. So it was a lot easier to categorize them then because the ones who stayed open did very well and the ones who were closed, like services, didn't do well. And tech did really well and services didn't. That's kind of the, the kind of polar um, from the pandemic. Um, it's probably a bit trickier to sort of predict what sectors are going to do better this time around. I know in Ireland, the ICT and pharma are kind of quite strong and performing very robustly. So it's not expected that they're going to um, sort of uh, decline over the course of the next couple of years. But then at the moment, Ireland isn't currently predicted to go into recession over the next few years. We're still expecting small level of economic growth this year, whereas that's not true for the UK, which is predicted to contract over the next two years Mm -hmm. and return to economic growth then. But having said, so those those forecasts are, uh, they're from the, the end of last year. And at the end of last year, most of Eurozone countries were also predicted to go into recession. And now it seems that most commentators are thinking that maybe a lot of the countries won't technically go into recession. But having said all of that, right, we're talking here about technical recessions. The bottom line is that people are going to feel like it's a recession because their incomes are going to grow mo- more slowly than prices. So standards of living are going to reduce even if we're not technically in a recession so from a mar- for, for marketers then who are selling goods and let's put it, marketers do lots of different jobs in different places you mentioned pharma there and people like but generally speaking marketers are selling goods that people want to buy right and there's b2b marketing as well which is slightly different we'll maybe come on to that but for consumer goods and things like that what impact does that confidence bit have on people's spending power if they feel like they have less money or they feel like there's a recession coming yeah it has a massive impact so um there's this uh consumer sentiment index um so uh surveys a bunch of people um you know ideal a representative sample of the population ask them how they feel about how the economy has done over the last year how do they feel about it next year? And um, what do they think about employment, inflation? And then ask them about their own household finances and savings. And, you know, what do they have any big purchase intentions and so on? So there's loads of things in there that influence consumer spending decisions. And that's what's contained in these consumer sentiment indices. So in Ireland, consumer sentiment reached its lowest level in 14 years um, last year. So the latest figures are even lower than those recorded at the onset of the pandemic. 
Um, so is that is the last time it was this low the the, the kind of the crashing end of the Celtic right. Tiger? Is that when it the uh, well, financial the, sort of the the start of the Great Recession? Yeah, 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 exactly. So I mean, it's it's quite telling. So it really reflects how people feel about the cost of living crisis and how you know their worries about energy poverty and so on affects their mm. uh, ability to spend. So what happens when people don't feel confident in the economy or in their own household finances? They save, they they accumulate what we call precautionary savings, the just in case um, sort of savings. Rainy day fund. Exactly, and that means that they, you know, they they're less likely to make that large purchase or book that holiday or take out that loan. So they build up their savings instead, just in case. And they, of course, the interest rate increase will also encourage this. It will encourage savings rather than spending. Yeah. And I think from my own research into kind of the history of recessions, this is uh, number two or number three in my working career. I forget. I'm getting old now. Uh, anyway, so uh, um, but o- over time, it, it's I think the one positive for marketers to take away from this is that a recession doesn't mean everything's going to shit and everyone's going to die and, and everyone's going to stop buying your product. And here we go. It means that the economy is going to shrink slightly over two consecutive periods. But there is some evidence from previous recessions that lots of sectors and lots of things grow over a recession. Many businesses thrive in recessions and often people will trade down, don't they? Which is another reason why I think people at the at the bottom financially struggle because they have nothing to trade down to. So people can trade down from a premium product to a slightly less premium product or, you know, kind of a night in product instead of a night out product, that sort of thing to save money. So is there any evidence of that that you've seen and and maybe the impact of that on lower income households as well? Um, so there's definitely evidence that people change their spending behavior when faced with price hikes. So if the cost of certain types of food increases, people um, substitute other types of food for them. So there are definitely opportunities for uh, people with or, uh, you know, products or firms with um, products that they think can replace maybe more expensive ones or ones that are, you know, have seen their price increase a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, over the last couple of years so I mean I think recessions are a great time for people to innovate um you know it's there's nothing like a bit of pressure um to to Uh, keep people trading I I can tell you from my own spending behavior when I had to consider using Klarna to buy a tub of Lurpak butter because it was over five quid for one of the little ones that's when I realized I was like yeah this is me trading down to something different I was like five pounds for butter I mean I don't what what have they done to the cows um so yeah so so people do adjust their spending behavior don't they based on the cost of certain things Mm -hmm. but that can change again it's not like everything comes down you have a your own sort of filter. Oh, I'll change down my butter. I'll change this. I'll change that. But I'm keeping the expensive pizza. There's no way I'm changing that or I'm keeping Kellogg's cereal Mm -hmm. or whatever. And so it is individual, isn't it, in terms of how that plays out. But you can make some kind of macro assumptions based on it's yeah, I mean, people people trade off cost for their their personal preferences. That's really what it boils down to. So, um, if if the cost is prohibitive, even if they really prefer a product, then they're going to trade away from it. And that's why governments can impose things like tobacco taxes and alcohol taxes because yeah. they they use them as a you know a a tool to get people to substitute away from these um sort of goods that have negative externalities and towards healthier goods. But people who really still want to smoke or drink are going to do it. Yeah. So from from a a marketer's perspective, there's a lot of uh, sensible research that talks about cutting prices um, is one of the stupidest things you can do at the moment in terms of uh, profitability impact and not so much cutting prices permanently, but discounting, sorry, um, is one of the stupidest things you can do. And I, there's a kind of a, my marketing head says yes I fully understand that but then I, to go back to this group of people who are sort of living on the poverty line and in low income households and things like that what sort of impact are you know brands not running prom- price promotions or you know putting prices up to five pounds for butter or whatever having on people at the at the lower end of the market and um, well I think that there are some really um, shocking effects on low income households for a start so that a lot of households are turning to food banks and you know warm hubs and so on and that's really terrible to see you know we would hope that policy would be able to address those issues at least in the short term until inflation unwinds a little bit and um, i suppose the the fact that uh, many governments in response to this crisis have focused on one off measures so um 
in um, Ireland, we have the energy credit. There have been a couple of top ups to people's social welfare payments, just kind of one off payments to see them through the winter or whatever. The fact that those aren't certain, um, as in once once they're gone, they're gone. And mm-hmm. the uh, at least in Ireland, the actual underlying core rates of welfare haven't been increased in line with inflation. I know that that's coming in the UK in April time. Um, it creates a lot of uncertainty for families who um, who might a lot of their income is made up of social welfare for whatever reason, if they're pensioners or have a disabled member or whatever it is. Um, and I mean, that's, that's creates a mental toll as well as everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, but the I suppose a lot of households will be waiting to see what's going to happen um, once the final one off payment happens right so is it are they well particularly in ireland is the government going to index um social welfare payments in line with inflation in order to allow those households to catch up with the new price level that as we've said it's not going away right the, the price increases are going to slow down but that new price level is here to stay and um so a, a lot of countries do this automatically they index um social welfare and tax payments automatically in line with price growth or wage growth or whatever it is the uk does that for many benefits ireland doesn't and there's kind of the mixture across the eu of whether they do or they don't the countries where they don't those countries are going to be the low income households in those countries are going to be feeling the pinch a bit more because they have this uncertainty about what's happening to their payment the next time it's reevaluated and, and there's a, a wider point, is it? I know I keep sort of bringing some of this back to, to marketing uh, for obvious reasons, but there's a... <laughs> Can't think wider. I don't know. <laughs> but but the, the, when we talk about sort of people in lower income households, what sort of percentage of the economy are, are we talking about? And, and does it change hugely across Ireland and the UK? Is it sort of broadly comparable in terms of the numbers involved? I think a lot of people are surprised by what the median household income is. Right. So the median household income is half of households have less than this and half has have more than it. And people are surprised how, by how low it is. And mm. um, there is a, a huge chunk of the economy that is living on what many people might think is a low household income. So household household disposable income is a good way to measure income. So that's uh, sort of what the um, poverty and inequality um, headline indices are based on, you know, when you hear that poverty is increased or inequality is decreased, that's what it's based on, household disposable income. You can also um, sort of scale that for the household composition, because we know that there are economies of scale. So this an extra adult doesn't cost the same as a first adult, a child doesn't cost the same as an adult. Um, so, but even doing that, you, you'd probably be surprised by um, how many households are living on you know less than the median or how, how, how many are living below a certain level mm-hmm. um it always strikes me as that something that people get shocked by when you show these statistics and, and i think that's one of the reasons why it's, it's really important for marketers so marketers are a very generally speaking a very weird bunch of people um they tend to come from a b households in, in the uk particularly tend to come from a b households over index in terms of fee paying schools um and often, certainly when you when you collide with sort of London ad agency world, that type of thing, it's really interesting what their view on on the world is in terms of the number of people who live in and the kind of this whole, well, um, you know, it's only the cost of a glass of wine. Why would that be an issue? You know, that, that kind of mentality. Mm-hmm. When you're used to paying ten pounds for a glass of wine, understanding that some people spend that, you know, whole household budget is less than 50 pounds for the week can be really a difficult thing to get your head around so it is interesting for to understand that actually it's not just a a small bunch of people at the margins we're talking about we are talking about vast swathes of the country people who buy the products that you're trying to sell are actually under severe financial pressure and are really impacted probably more than you are by this rising cost of of everything that's right yeah, and so I, it's I, I do, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this episode mm-hmm. to to kind of shine a light on the fact that it's not everyone sitting around going, oh, I'm, only, I'm not going to be able to buy this wine anymore this week. Mm-hmm. I'll have to only buy this one. Um, there are real sort of factors and choices behind it. And- it, it, it the, I suppose the other thing I stop banging on about this soon, but the the other thing about the fact that low income households are most affected by inflation at the moment, they also don't have savings to fall back on, right? So many of the higher income household families have pandemic savings. 
right? Where they, they didn't spend a lot during the pandemic. They couldn't spend on their services. And they're just unwinding that now. That's cushioning them. And they, you know, maybe not really feeling the effects of the cost of living crisis because they have savings to fall back on. Low income households also are less likely to have somebody in work. Um, they might be lone parents, they might be pensioners, whatever. Um, so they're not going to see wage increases. They're really dependent on government decisions about indexing or providing one-off top-ups. You know, they, there is no cushion there apart from government. Yeah. And, and there's some long-term impact as well of this, isn't there? So you might be thinking, okay, yeah, my product's selling well at the minute or not, but th- there's a long-term impact of uh, people making the choice between heating and eating, which is the, the sort of current mantra at the minute. And there's a lot of discussions about that because it does over the next one, five, 10 years, continue to have an impact. It has a ripple impact, doesn't it? Which again, market is a great at thinking short term this week, this month, this quarter. I even work with one company once who uh, used to review sales every hour. Um, I find it I, I, honestly, I, I just, my head exploded. I know you, uh, the size of them, they needed to do something, but yeah, it, it was ridiculous. Um, so yeah, that, that's long-term thinking every week, every month, but actually this is going to have a huge impact on where the, where the economy and where the market goes next, isn't it? Because austerity or people living in austere conditions, it has a ripple impact over decades. It does. And it, there's, there's a lot of research on this. So if income inequality in a country increases, so that, that's the gap between rich and poor, so if the rich get richer and the poor are getting poorer, it leads to a kind of a them and us scenario, right? So people people don't have a sort of sense of social cohesion. And that can, you know, that can lead to sort of extreme voting behavior, social unrest. Um, <clears throat> yeah, 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 you can say the B word too. So it, it does have really long lasting and ripple effects well beyond the spending habits of, you know, households mm-hmm. who are under pressure. Just as soon as uh, soon as you brought Brexit up, um, <laughs> maybe you did. <laughs> Talk to me about the the impact of Brexit on what the UK is going through at the minute. Because if, from what I've seen and the the issue, the the figures I look at, the UK is it. Well, this is a global problem in European terms. The UK is struggling worse than most of the European Union nations in how they are cushioned and impacting the issues of these rising prices yeah i mean it's it's very difficult to consider the issues being faced by the uk at the moment without thinking about brexit i mean it's clearly a massive factor and the extent of the effect is kind of hard to measure because so much else is going on at the same time um but certainly the trade flows between the uk and the eurozone are down like well down on what they were beforehand and that i mean that has to be contributing to Mm -hmm. um the the fact that the uk is probably going into recession and it will continue continue to contribute to its long-run economic trajectory in the future now you know maybe there'll be a bounce back um who knows but um at the moment it looks like brexit is uh definitely negatively contributing to the uk's economic situation so uh paper by one of my co-authors at the ESRI recently showed that trade flows are down by about 20 percent um which is pretty massive so it's just a willful act of self-harm that's all it was <laughs> it's just let's jump out of this plane without a parachute why because we're British it just I I, I clearly not a Brexiteer um obviously but I I just with the lies we were sold to make this happen I just it's very hard to understand from a sort of more, I say, a more outside perspective, but we're not really outside it in Ireland. I mean, it really affects us as well. And um, the UK is one of our big trading partners, although that importance has been going down over time as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I suppose much to our relief now. But yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah it's. Um, I, I just, I, I think there's um an emotional versus rational. So again, this is a, a great lesson for marketers: is that. Um, it, emotion often trumps rational thinking when it comes to how people buy and their buying behavior and their purchase behavior and their behavior of putting crosses in boxes. So, you know, what, what were the reasons for staying in the European Union? They were all rational reasons, right? There was no emotive reason to stay in the EU. Um, it made a lot of bloody sense. <laughs> you know, it was the sensible <laughs> thing to do. It was, a, you know, just put stay in. But the emotive reasons were all about stay, were all about leaving. You know, that they banged the drum about migrants and about the NHS and about mm-hmm. us being better. And, and what were the answers to that? Oh, well, you know, we, we could 
trade more with Europe if we stayed in. It's like the, the average punter down the street who worries about the heating bill, not about how much the business is going to trade with Europe. And there's an interesting look at what works for, for your messaging. If you want to take a hard right turn into what does that mean for your marketing material? It's like, well, stop talking about features all the time because nobody cares and give them an emotive reason to buy your product. Um, the lessons of That's Brexit, if we can take a positive one, um, mm -hmm. is that emotive messaging can trump rational messaging. Um, but there you go. A little marketing lesson for you there, I think. Thank you very much. Um, so what are the things we can learn? So we, we've, we've, just off the back of Brexit, which was shooting ourselves in the foot, then came the pandemic, now comes the recession. Are there any lessons from any of those two things that we can use to kind of set a course to, to or stay positive about what, what's coming over the next little bit? Well, I thought that uh, the policy reaction to the pandemic was quite interesting because clearly lessons were learned from the Great Recession, right? So during the Great Recession, both the UK and Ireland saw pretty serious austerity measures um that didn't happen during the pandemic so the pandemic the um the policy response was to sort of keep the economy on ice to pump money in to keep workers connected to their firms as far as possible to um increase the incomes of those who had lost their jobs so that they would continue spending and you know and and it worked so because it was a sort of short term shock to the economy that whole keeping it on ice um, strategy worked because then when they you know when firms were ready to get back into business when the public health restrictions had eased they were able to because they still had their staff their staff had been connected to them all throughout they hadn't had to emigrate for the most part because they had um, been um, provided with financial support and so on so uh, there was I, I mean I think there are lessons there to the extent that we think this is also a temporary shock and I think most commentators would say that it probably is right so they what happens to inflation over the next year or two partly depends on um the war in Ukraine but even with the war still ongoing things are starting to stabilize already right so things are coming down already so in the absence of any further massive adverse shocks you know we're sort of on course for a recovery over the next year or two so the whole Keeping things on ice strategy is probably a good one uh, for this scenario as well. Yeah. A costly one, though. A costly one. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. been a lot of talk, or, and it seems to be gaining traction over the years, of a guaranteed minimum income, certainly in the UK, mm -hmm. um, which I think is probably against most Tories thinking generally, but there is currently a think tank with a lot of senior Tories involved um, who are now advocating for this. What's your view on that? Because from a, again, from my marketing hat on, having a guaranteed minimum income must stimulate demand with people knowing that they have X amount to spend and it kind of simplifies the benefits system and gets away knowing that every household is going to have X to spend. Surely there must be benefits from a, an individual's household. You, you mentioned about the problems people have, worrying about where's the next money come from. If there's a guaranteed minimum income, then, then it helps them in terms of getting back into economic activity, which is we know is a problem in the UK for people uh, in terms of mental health issues and, and health issues. But also from the other side, from the demand side, people have got money, they can spend it. So surely... Are there any downsides to this? What are the issues? And um, so the, the guaranteed minimum income or universal basic income has been uh, sort of it, it's been talked about for decades now, I suppose, in developed countries. But it's been sort of increased in popularity over the last few years. There was a pilot done in Finland and lots of other countries are thinking about their own pilots. So the idea is as follows. You would basically abolish all benefits if you if you do it in its pure form. Right. You abolish yeah. all benefits including in-work benefits, everything. And you replace those with uh, a minimum income. And, you know, what the what level that is set at, you know, depends on policymakers, I suppose. But really, you wouldn't want anyone to be doing worse off on it. So it would probably have to be set pretty high, right? Mm -hmm. So to the level of the highest benefit level. And then you have to fund it through higher taxes, right? So that that's the problem bit, right? So you, mm -hmm. and a lot of the studies show that in order to, give a minimum income to everybody that doesn't leave anybody worse off and um, you need to impose a tax rate of like 60 70 percent right so that's a flat tax rate on everybody so that that is the big downside a, a now, flat tax rate yes exactly oh. 
So, I mean, there are lots, there are lots of positives to the idea of a uh, mm-hmm. minimum income. You've touched on some of them and um, it, it could help people to be more creative and innovative in their enterprise. We don't have to worry about, you know, being profitable straight away and um, it can encourage people to go for a job they really like to you know wait for the right job and um, mental health benefits you're also you're also sort of rewarding people who take undertake caring duties like caring for elderly parents or caring for children they you know they're being recognized through the system so there are lots of positives to it the big downside is it is very expensive and we don't we're not really sure how it would affect work overall so you know you might encourage people to join the workforce because they wouldn't be giving up their minimum income once they got paid mm-hmm. but at the other end of the spectrum you've got people who are already in work who have to pay a much higher tax rate and they some of those will drop out of the labor market and the people who will drop out are secondary earners in a couple um Secondary earners are the ones who earn the least in a couple. That's typically women because of the gender wage gap and traditional divisions of work and caring roles. So you'd see probably a lot of women dropping out of the labor force to care for children. And in terms of gender equality, that's probably not the best thing either. Yeah. <laughs> so many ripple effects that, that to the UBI. Again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably not. Um, what, is Finland's trial still ongoing? I'm not going to ask you for the ins and outs of Finland's trial because you've probably not researched it. But is it still ongoing? Is it finished? Did they can um, it? What was the? I'm. I think. I think the the jury's in on it, uh, and I'm. I'm actually not sure. I think. Yeah. I won't. I think I know, I'll put you a, on the spot there. No, completely like on the spot. I think it was a. Here are the positives and here are the negatives of it, and let's consider doing it yeah. full time. But I'm not. I'm not sure what stage in that deliberation they've got to. Okay. Well. Um, I, I want to pick back up on on the uh, that, that sort of classic Irish understatement that you used right at the beginning, seeing as you brought it back in with the Finland question again. Um, so take me back to your career. You mentioned, was it Trinity you mentioned at, at Dublin, in Dublin, was mm-hmm. it, and Cambridge University? So what took you into being an economist? Because I, I don't know that people grow up wanting to be an economist, do they? Uh, no, definitely not. No, no. Uh, I wanted to be a vet. Um, I did. I studied business and French in Trinity. Um, so that was, you know, I, I actually did marketing in second year, I think. Don't remember <laughs> what, what much. What were your thoughts on it? <laughs> I really enjoyed it, but it wasn't for me. Um, and then I, I actually majored in um, accountancy and finance in my final year. So I didn't really do a lot of economics in my undergrad. I then went off to work for an auditing firm, which I won't name, and I hated it. So then I was like, right, time to go back to school. So I um, did, I, I decided on economics. I liked economics as part of the business degree. Um, so I did a graduate diploma in Cambridge and then went to do my master's in UCD and the PhD there as well. So, um, yeah, it was a, kind of a, a roundabout way to come at it, I suppose. Okay. No, and, and I, I don't want to kind of force you into political statements or anything like that. That's not where I'm going with this question. But you you research and look at a lot of, as you said at the beginning, on people who are um, sort of on low incomes and things like that. Um, how do you think government policy, not impacts them, but supports people like that? You know, it often feels to me like it's political football, how governments treat people on the lowest incomes rather than actually what's the best for the people involved in that. Is that what you see or is that, is that just my political leanings lean uh, sort of focused on what I see? Um, I suppose there's a cynical view of it. And then there's the view that, you know, maybe they're doing their best. I, it, it, you know, it really depends. Right. So it, it varies from year to year, the budgetary cycle, and it varies depending on who's in. So um, in the UK, indexation of benefits is sort of established, but often it's like, oh, we're not doing it this year. And that that's kind of concerning like if you if you establish a system of indexation there should be a really good reason to not do it because that establishing that system provides certainty and certainty is great for the market and it's great for households they know exactly what's coming if you don't do it then you have to have a really good reason and it, it should be should be a credible reason that people can understand and say okay well we, we get it we can't afford it or that'll crash the economy or whatever but you know when you when you're in a situation where tax cuts are being promised or other things like that but and um, benefits aren't going to be indexed that's you know that's a bit concerning and you wonder are, you know political parties just trying to appeal to their voters and um, yes. we do we do a post budget analysis every year at the SRI where we show yeah. overall what's the distributional impact of the package 
And the thing the media always pick up on is, is it progressive or regressive? So is it progressive as in it, it um, affects, so it's more beneficial for low income households compared to high income households. So policymakers like to say, oh, it's a progressive package. We're really targeting low income households. A regressive package is one that uh, targets high income households. And I mean, it, it's not that black and white, right? So there might be a good reason to target high income households if you want to encourage women into the labour market, let's say secondary earners, you have to you have to target that portion of the income distribution. But by and large, in an environment where, you know, prices are growing and low income households are, stu- are struggling, you really want to be targeted in the nature of your support. And that was, I mean, there was a lot of talk about targeting last year um, in the UK, in Ireland, and at the Eurozone level, the EU... Um, the European Commission and the OECD were coming out and saying, listen, make your packages targeted. We don't want to further fuel inflation. And that was the risk. You know, if you promise massive ta- tax cuts at a time when prices are growing, they're going to grow even further. So any support you provide has to be targeted at the lowest income households. Now, I think on balance, both the UK and Irish governments probably managed that um, in the end. I'd say that for the UK. <laughs> it's it's not how you start, it's how you finish, right? You know, we, we, yeah, we got exactly. there in the end. Yeah, we got we defenestrated <laughs> the right people and we got there in the end. Trial and error, so yeah. yeah. So uh, as we get to the end, I, I want to come back. A lot of marketers, and I, I bang on about this when I speak at conferences, focus on all the wrong things, right? We focus on um, kind of marketing metrics, how many people have seen something or clicked on it or gone through to the landing page. And then when you go to the board and you start telling them this, they're just like, yeah, but how many things did we sell? What profit did we make? And we, we talk about all the wrong things. So over the next year or two, if a re- recession does hit and over the next three, six, 12 months, people in marketing are going to be going into meetings and being told budgets are being cut because there's a recession on or this has to come down because there's a recession on. What are the things that we can look at for knowing that the green shoots are happening to be able to sit in that meeting and go, ah, but the um, CPI have said that the RPT has gone back up. So therefore we should be, you know what, one of the exactly clever that. things that we should be looking for that we, that we can actually go, right, do you know what? We can see that's happening. Therefore we know we're kind of getting towards the end of this or, or these are the green shoots. What things can people look for to find some hope in all of this? Well, CPI is a good first one, right? So when CPI starts to come down, so it's currently at 10 or 9% or yeah. something like that, when that starts to come down, that is a good sign, right? So that means that price growth is slowing. Doesn't mean that prices are going down, but that growth is slowing. Um, another one to watch would be household disposable income. That, at the end of the day, is what households have to spend. That is their post-tax and transfer income. Um, if you can look at that, scaled by the number of people in the household even better because it tells you how far that income has to go there's also another metric um called after housing costs income so the housing costs are one of those things that's sort of hard to avoid right so mm-hmm. disposable income takes off your tax that's your benefits but if you can also subtract housing costs from that as sort of an unavoidable thing that households have to pay for gives you an idea of how much they have left over for other things that you might want to be marketing to them. So I'd I'd be looking at household incomes, I'd be looking at prices and, you know, okay, in Ireland, GDP growth doesn't make a lot of sense to look at. We have another indicator, GNI star, which is sort of more suitable for the Irish economy because it's so reliant on multinationals. But GDP growth is also, I mean, you the economy can be in recession because um, GDP is declining by 10% or it can be in recession because it's declining by half a percent. So those are very different things. Yeah, so to see that. No, they, they're good things to be able to check out and then see how they go. And it's the Bank of England generally who published those forecasts in the UK, I think, is it? And the, or the, I know they're talked about by other people. Um, so in Ireland would be the Central Statistics Office, whatever the equivalent of that in the UK is. I'm uh, not sure. And, is it? And, yeah, the statistic. It's, national, it's NISRA in Northern Ireland. It's a different thing in the, in the rest of the UK. Okay. So anyway, yeah, them. Them. Yeah, the stats people. <laughs> Um, and I think the Office of Budget Responsibility. No, there's something different. They're about it, yeah. They well, the, their reports are very useful to look at as well because they give a very uh, independent overview of the economy. So yeah. I would uh, strongly advise a look at their website as well. Excellent stuff. Excellent. And they, well, phys- look- just a shout out then the Fiscal Council in Ireland do the same thing. Brilliant stuff. Brilliant. <laughs> so look, I, I think it's 
uh, the lesson for me for marketers is to understand that these the decisions that are being taken at government level and policy it might seem a bit abstract to us and what's happening to people on the ground and recessions and a lot of the terminology that's used man, man, don't, this doesn't really impact me it does the amount of money people have in the pocket impacts everything we do as marketers so uh, understanding this getting a better being able to track it and knowing what goes on is, is great to be able to then go back it when you're sitting in those meetings and your budget's being hammered at least you might be able to take some of this and go karina said <laughs> don't cut my budget because karina said look at this it's going down and that's going up so we're fine um and that's perfectly okay the people can bring you up and oh yeah into... karina said that's the thing yeah absolutely perfect um uh, so listen karina thank you very much for your time it's been brilliant to understand a little bit more about what's going on in the market understand why brexit is such a catastrophe i'll clip that bit up and put it out in the uh in the show promo karina said this and um yeah and thank you very much for your time you're very welcome thanks for having me thank you